Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative webinar. We're very honored today to have um, Amy Troyer Keen join us with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. She's a plant ecologist and the first scientist to be awarded the Outstanding Women in Texas Government Award. Uh, she traveled to 214 of Texas 254 counties to collect 14,000 field data points and help develop over 300 ecological mapping systems. This is an outstanding statewide data set. Um, it has multiple levels. It's 10 meter resolution. She's going to tell us about this process. Um, to create the Texas Mapping Systems Application and Dissemination of Big Data. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Amy and thank her for sharing what she knows with us today. Thanks for having me, Sally. And hi, everybody in cyberspace. Um, like Sally said, I wanted to talk some about our experience um, land cover mapping throughout the state of Texas. Uh, give a little bit about how we are using the data and how others use the data. And then talk some about um, difficulties associated with delivering uh, these data um, to folks across the state um, and uh, across the nation. So, and then hopefully have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to really breeze through a lot of the methods. So if you have detailed questions, I welcome them warmly at the end of the talk. So, um, about Seven or eight years ago now, uh, we were approached with the idea to create a better land cover for the state of Texas. Um, and as always, we said, show me the money. You know, It cost about um, five million to, re to create a new land cover map for the state. The last time we did this was in 1984. Um, and that was pre-mobile GPS units and pre-laptops. Um, kind of ice age compared to where we are now um, technology-wise. So we had some pretty big goals. We wanted to increase the spatial resolution. We were shooting for a 10-meter um, map and increase the thematic resolution, which we did. The 1984 veg types for the state had 18 classes. Um, we have 398 habitat types. So um, we think we really achieved our goal there. We were looking at better accuracy and really wanted to interpret the landscape as it occurs on the ground today in Texas. Um, a state the size of Texas requires a lot of partners. Um, the main partner was Dr. David Diamond's group out of the University of Missouri, MORAP. They did most of the remote sensing um, and a lot of the ecological interpretation for us. So that being said, this is about seven years of methods in mostly one slide. So really an overview, as we um, moved across the landscape and encountered different challenges, these methods varied some, um, but this is sort of the general way we went about it, right? Uh, the first thing we did was create a mostly remote sense land cover map. And I say mostly um, because we found that if we applied a little bit of modeling to the remote sensing, we could really um, increase our accuracy. Um, and this is just like an NLCD land cover map, about 15 classes um, using three to five dates of satellite imagery at a 30 meter resolution <clears throat> to create those 15 classes. At the same time, we were generating layers of abiotic variables for the modeling part. So really heavily relying on NRCS circle spoiled units and assign, assigning things like landscape position, um, slope, aspect, geology when we could uh, to those soil polygons. Uh, when we had both those things, the land cover map and the soil polygons attributed with abiotic variables, we would create what we, um, what we call image objects from 10 meter nape aerial photos. So 10 meter nape layered with the Landsat remote sense land cover map layered with the soil polygons or abiotic variables. And you combine all three of those and those image objects then become one of the 398 types. Um, and I get into more detail in the next few slides, so bear with me in a minute. So here's what we call our model land cover. And again, it's mostly remote sense. Um, we just found that you could, if you added things like aspects 
you could really increase your accuracy um, to the land cover map. So 15 basic classes looks probably pretty familiar to everybody familiar with land cover mapping. Um, you take those basic land covers and create um, a classification. We use NatureServe's um, ecological system, um, plant communities tied to abiotic types. It's pretty convenient when you're using abiotic types in the modeling. Um, so we recognized early on that within each NatureServe parent system, based on those classes of land cover, we could map several different types. So for example here, in a Madrian um, lower montane pine, oak, forest, and woodland, which is a pretty broad scale ecological system, we could map several land cover types. Uh, a grassland type, an evergreen oak pine shrubland, um, a mixed woodland type, and of course an evergreen pine woodland type, right? So that's pretty cool, but we went even a step further, right? We went out and I sampled all this, um, all the 14,000 different um, points across the state. And we collected um, information on dominant species, land cover type, percent class, uh, percent cover of each vegetation strata, all associated to a GPS point on the ground of a 50, about 50 by 50 meter plot. Um, and this was roadside, private land, public land, uh, anywhere I could get to. So now we had all this information on these plant communities um, associated with species and abiotic site types. So not only do you get those different land cover types, um, but based on all those abiotic variables and the field data, you can now take one land cover and in a certain area, say Culberson County in West Texas, and create many different ecological mapping systems or habitat types. So grassland in one county, we had mapped as 11 different map types based on elevation. So we know that at mid to um, high elevations, you get a mountain grassland system. Um, while at low to mid, you get a hill or foothill grassland type system. So things like Chino Grama, Black Grama on slope. And as you go down the slope into the desert floor, you get seven different grassland types based on soil, community, soil types alone. And these truly have different plants associated with them and different shrubby invaders. So you can start to look at potential for woody invasion um, within each type. And then of course you have differences based on hydrology. So you can start to see that not only is, are the map types of value, but all that abiotic information within the data set itself is of um, huge value in planning and landscape conservation. So some of our results and the map on your right, this is all 398 types, um, not very easily displayed um, by color, but there they are. And we did hit most of our goals. We have higher spatial resolution. We mapped them at 10 meters. Again, we mapped 398 different mapping systems. <clears throat> uh, the agreement with the ground data varied from 74 to 90 percent, um, dependent upon land cover type. So struggling communities were a little more difficult to get exactly right, um, and based on geographic region as well. And we really think we did a good job interpreting what Texas looks like on the ground today. Uh, we mapped 19 different native and exotic, um, mostly woodland types, um, invading on native prairie soils. So the ecological interpretation, uh, I think we did a pretty good job. So what did we learn? Um, analyzing 18 million polygons on a statewide scale is not easy for anyone's desktop. So we're still sort of looking at the data and seeking out some of our results. We did map over 69 million hectares. Of those 398 types, the two that contributed most to land area were row crops at about 10% and native invasive mesquite at 6.1%. Um, here you can really start to see conversion of our grasslands to these different types. Um, of all the map types, only 25 contributed greater than 1% to land area, which is still a pretty big area when you're talking 69 million hectares. 
Um, but 278 of our types contribute um, to less than 0.1% of the land area of Texas. And this is displayed graphically <clears throat> on the top graph here, where I've ordered each of the map types by smallest to largest on the x-axis, um, and then have percent land area on the y-axis. And you can see, based on the reverse J-curve, that only a handful of types contribute a lot to land area, while a whole bunch of types over here contribute just a little bit to land area. And why is that sort of significant? Um, when you look at the field data, and again, on the x-axis, I have um, field data sorted by map types, ordered by percent or contribution to land area. But on the y-axis, I have percent of total field data collected. So it has a very similar pattern where we collected a whole lot of data um, in large land areas of Texas, right? It says, well, at least we got it right, you know, in the large areas. What it also tells us, though, is it's really difficult to measure accuracy in these smaller land area, smaller habitat types that contribute a little bit to land area. Um, but also gives us target areas for updating the map. <clears throat> so how do we use these data? <clears throat> well, it's sort of user interpretation. Um, I get all sorts of emails and calls from people using it in different ways. Um, species habitat modeling is, a, is sort of a gimme, right? Um, really great tool for looking at um, both rare and common species and how they're using the habitat. Um, all of the things in yellow are things Texas Parks and Wildlife is doing. Some of them I'll go into more detail. Um, we're developing interpretive materials, an enduring features layer, again, species modeling. Statewide, we can look at landscape change and things like climate change and urbanization. Um, we've done some watershed analysis. Um, one of the projects I'm going to go into detail on are the Texas Ecological Indices, another statewide data layer, um, and then some distribution tools. <clears throat> so along with the data set comes this pretty cool interpretive guide. You get a scientific description of the parent system, right, that nature serve ecological system. Each of the map types within that system, a uh, description of those, a distribution map for each type, a photograph of an example of each type. So each of those 14,000 field data points has a photograph attached. So we went through those and picked a representative and assigned it to that site. And then where you could go on public lands and actually view the ecosystem or ecological mapping system. Um, Dave Diamond last year completed what we're calling enduring features layer. So along with um, all that data, we have this really nice layer of abiotic features that don't change over time. So things like soils, landscape position, geology, um, aspects. And we'll be using that, of course, for map updates, but we'll also be available to the public. So we're pretty excited about that new data set as well. <clears throat> um, this is a student over at Stephen F. Austin University. He's using it for black bear habitat suitability modeling. Um, folks are using it for golden chief warbler modeling um, and other um, SGCN species we have here in Texas. Um, this is a coworker of mine, our program leader, Dwayne German, put together a rapid analysis for a potential reservoir, um, looking at how many acres of impacted bottomland hardwoods um, if a reservoir were to go in along the Navasota River. So water planning um, for this tool. And then, again, the other statewide layer is we are looking at a way to sort of identify areas that provide um, the best landowner incentives or conservation value, and we're calling these ecological indices. Um, sort of twofold, not only to provide incentives, but um, provide areas to avoid for transportation or development projects. <clears throat> I am very briefly going to go over the method. Method, so please ask me questions after. Um, we are looking at this from a very Texas Parks and Wildlife centric um, view, and these are species that we are concerned with at Parks and Wildlife, um, what we call species of conservation need or SGCN species. 
and also some of our species of economic and recreational importance. Um, the first thing we sort of do is have our taxa experts select local species by ecoregion. We create range maps for those species. Um, define those range maps by units. And for units, we are using hydrologic units, um, just because they're somewhat random and not tied to landowner boundaries. Once we have a range map defined by hydrologic units, we create a list of all of those map types, any of those 398 types that occur within the range. And each focal species gets two scores. They get a score in the hydrologic unit called occupancy confidence rating. Um, that's a one to three score, one being that unit um, occurs within the species range uh, but does not have a recent occurrence record or any occurrence record for that species. Two, three, we have a recent occurrence of this species and good geographic information. And then we sit with experts throughout the state for each species, and they assign a potential habitat score to each of those map types occurring within its range. Those are combined, and this is what each species map would look like. Darker green being higher occupancy confidence rating and higher potential habitat score, or species terrestrial ecological index score is what we're calling it. So this is not a critical habitat map. It is both data-based and expert opinion-based. Um, what we're using it for is sort of landscape-level conservation planning. So the biggest thing for our buck conservation-wise, right? So all of these species are then combined. And I think for the Wildland Desert, we had like 32 fauna species. The simple additive model to create what we call the Terrestrial Faunal Ecological Index. <clears throat> and this is the Chihuahua Desert in Texas, um, clipped by ecoregion. We've completed three ecoregions, um, the Chihuahua Desert, High Plains, and Southwestern Tableland. And you can see, if you're familiar with the area, oops, you can see that there's grasslands here. This would be market grasslands, Delaware Mountain grasslands really tend to rank high um, in this index score for our faunal species. Um, green being higher scoring again, brown being red, which red and orange, which have a lower score. So we have sort of a faunal ecological index. And what we like about this is we can mix and match species for these. So once we have the model, if we don't want to include our species of economic and recreational importance, we can pull them out and just look at SGPN species. We can just look at birds, or we can just look at um, uh, mammals if we're interested. So mixing and matching species, kind of creating custom models is a big benefit for the way we're doing this modeling. We've also created a flora index. This was done a bit differently from the faunal species. Um, we had, do not have a lot of data on their plants here in Texas, and range maps um, just they're either too broad or too spotty or just inaccurate. So we just looked at each mapping system, crosswalked all of our SGCM plants and associations to each map type, um, totaled them up, and then looked at, gave it sort of an area qualifier. So what we wanted to do was not look at matrix communities that have, by default, like Creosote in West Texas, by default, have a lot of rare plants because they take up a large land area. But we really wanted to score higher some of the smaller communities that still have a represented number of, of SGCN species. So we weighted it by size as well, giving the smaller communities more weight. And as expected, our Sky Island areas tend to score really high on this index. Um, but surprisingly, our sort of desert pavement and southerly facing slopes along the Rio Grande also scored high. Um, our inland fishery folks looked at our fishes of Texas distribution and water quality and also created an index. I apologize, it is not well represented at this re resolution, but it is somewhat intuitive. As you get closer to a riparian area, um, you sort of score higher on this scale. All of three of these indices were combined 
to create our Texas Ecological Indices or Composite Index. And again, this is a simple additive model with each of these being weighted depending upon how many species they have. Um, but what I find most interesting, again, green being higher scoring, red and orange lower scoring, is that if I were to overlay conservation lands on this map, and while our mountain areas scored somewhat high, the areas that scored the highest are these grassland areas, Delaware mountain areas, Marfa grasslands, um, areas that we have very few or no conservation lands in. So we may be missing the boat over here in West Texas conservation land. So 18 million polygons, how do we deliver these data to, to folks? And we are looking at um, distributing the ecological indices um, both internally and to our partners. So we're not sure about a public facing application for that yet um, because of the chances of misinterpretation, but um, for partners we think we're going to make it available. So the delivery challenges are how do you process these data and store it, of course. Um, most PCs can't run a statewide analysis and it takes a long time to do even a FIFA region wide analysis. <coughs> For landowners and land managers, most people don't have GIS software, um, and it's not intuitive. So we have sort of a two-phase solution. We are distributing all of the data via vector files by ecoregion. Um, they were initially available by phase, but we, we've sort of phased into just ecoregion. And then we, are, we do have a Google, Google Maps application available um, for folks without GIS software. <clears throat> and that is now available, which we're pretty excited about. Our goals here were to deliver all of these um, data to a wide audience, provide basic interpretive tools, and some basic GIS and analysis tools. And I have a demo video that, that shows some of this. Um, this is the team app when you land in it. And TEAM stands for Texas Ecosystem Analytical Mapper. If anybody's going to go visit this website, please open it in Chrome browser. It seems to work the best. Um, so you get Texas counties. You zoom in. You get your basic Google map tools up here. Um, I had a video that kind of went through the Google map stuff, just the viewer tools. Um, but I thought we'd kind of skip that um, to save a little time and talk more about the analysis, which is really the meat of it. So the screen map, again, Google, Google Maps tools, all of the layers we have available here. Um, and they turn them on and off as you zoom in. We do link to our county level endangered species and our uh, map viewing extent area is everything in here. The analysis wizard is what I would really like you all to see. This is sort of, again, the heart of the project. So I have a video. So this is over actually in West Texas in Brewster County in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, that green polygon in the middle is uh, Elephant Mountain Wildlife Management Area, one of our properties. But we do have our public land data set in here. Uh, there is when you log in, you can approach the analysis by clicking on the wizard or open the accordion. Um, it gives you links to the data download, which I provided the link on the uh, next couple slides. So uh, there will be time to write that down if you want to go to it. Again, information about the application. Um, and the ability to create custom vegetation reports. So remember all those different types that are crosswalks um, in the data? the parent system, the model land cover. Um, you can analyze by any of those different types uh, in the Google Maps tool. So it's going to name a study area. <clears throat> I'm going to call this one Elephant Mountain. Um, you can add several different polygons. There are limits in Google Maps. You can only analyze 100, I think around 100,000 acres, and even that sort of spins for a while. Um, you can draw a polygon for your area of interest, select one from the map, uh, or actually upload a shape file or a KML or KMZ file if you have one. 
Um, so some of the viewer tools include setting transparency. There is a slider bar so you can look at um, the aerial image underneath the data if you want. But you can really see the detail in the ecological mapping system data at the scale, um, looking at different slope and aspects. So yeah, you can upload a, a boundary file. Eventually you'll be able to draw one here in here and export it. Um, and save it in Google Earth or, or wherever you need to. So you can do multiple boundaries. Um, we're also working on the option to clip things like the MHD and buffer segments of lines and run an analysis on those. Um, upload points. So if you have like Greening Bird survey points, you want to buffer and look at habitat types, you'd be able to do that in here as well. I really like it for smaller analysis because I don't have to actually go and fetch the data layer, upload it. It's all already in here. So you can simply draw a polygon just like in Google Earth. Uh, I really think if you use Google Maps or Google Earth, you can pretty easily use this um, scene tool. So <clears throat> let's say you are a biologist at our WMA. You're doing a conservation easement on the property next door, and you want to see how much additional habitat that gives you. Um, simply click Run Report. First thing you get is sort of an interactive report that lists each map type in your study area. Um, total acres in your study area boundary. Um, how many acres of each type. And if you turn off the background map, you get a picture of your area alone. So it gives you acres, sectors, percent total of each type. You click on more, you get a description, and then each of the crosswalks map type. Uh, details of each polygon. So let's say you're a landowner who's receiving lip funding to remove woody species. You can actually target an area um, of a specific size. And then you get a pie chart of each of those different land cover types, which I think it's probably the coolest feature. So, and as you click on those, um, it'll tell you what each um, slice of your pie, what each type it means. And then, if you select the different land cover types, so this is Nature Serve Parent System, it switches it in the display over here. And it'll also switch it in your summary table and your details. So, it sort of reanalyzes the data by that land cover type. Those are simple modeled land covers, so deciduous shrubs. Descriptive land cover has things like slope and riparian in it. And we have a type for our wildlife biologists in there that they use in their management plan. So once you've decided on your types, you can actually create a report that you can print or download. So they do is click on print report. And we are working on the export function um, and save functions. We haven't gotten there yet. But this, this functionality is all there and available um, for any of you guys today. So you can select what you want in your report. Right now it only prints 8.5 by 11. So you need to adjust your map, but it'll print a map. Um, county level endangered species data, all of your charts, your summary data, and descriptions for each map site. Um, so I think if you know you're going out to visit a property for potential conservation easement, this is a pretty good tool to take with you. <coughs> and just go to export or print, and you get this really cool um, report. Right, and again, it has all of your map types. Um, and I think it orders it by size, so mixed desert shrubland um, contributes the most to land area in your study area. Um, sparse tree is like shrub. Um, again, you get all of the charts and a list of endangered species that occur within that colony. So um, the county level endangered species information is being pulled from another Texas Parks and Wildlife application um, and just sort of put into your report. So that, that was already there. We just built it in. So um, for updates for the delivery for this data, we're working on the ability to actually, like I said, buffer points and clip and buffer lines. Um, coming sometime next year, we're hoping we can get folks to 
be able to set up user profiles in the team app and actually save all their boundaries, edit their map, um, hopefully provide us some crowdsourcing back, so help us keep the ground cruising and improve our land cover data set. Add that enduring features layer in there, do some analysis um, with both the vegetation and the enduring features, um, and then create a mobile version, so iPhone, iPad version. Um, and with that, um, these are all the links. The top link will go right to the team app, and the other two links are for downloading the vector data. Um, if you have any questions, I would love to take them. I know I went through a lot of that pretty fast, but um, please ask questions. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Amy. That was a really great presentation, full of useful information. <laughs> Thanks. And would you be willing to share your uh, slides with the participants of the webinar today? Oh, absolutely. Okay, great. Can you, can you just post them somewhere and they can download them? They are more than welcome to them. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, and I'll, um, in order to unmute yourself and ask a question, you'll press star six. <coughs> and uh, so we'll go ahead and, and take questions now. I'll go ahead and unmute the caller so that in case you're having an issue with the... Hi, this the is conference is now in talk mode. Okay, Hi, great. Go ahead. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for the Desert LCC. Um, Amy, thanks so much for this presentation. It looks like a really great project. Um, I was wondering, was there a slide that kind of summarized um, how you think this work is going to be used? Um, this slide is sort of currently how it's being used a little bit. Um, and this is by no means all encompassing of how it's being used. It's just um, briefly some, some things I've compiled from emails I get from folks around the state using it. So cool. again, anywhere from species habitat modeling to agriculture analysis, environmental site assessments, um, mitigation. Our tech stop, our highway department actually uses this data daily for reviewing highway projects. So, you know, it's sort of being used on all levels across the state, which is pretty cool. That's really great. Yeah, I, I knew you had a slide on this, but I wanted to see it again after seeing, <laughs> understanding more about what the project entails and being able to think about additional um, potential applications. Oh, thanks. Right. Um, I saw Mobile has emailed me several times asking for the data. They don't really explain to me why, how they're using it, but I'm, I can only imagine, right? So, <laughs> you know, we get, we get everyone. I mean, like, even, like I said, Exxon, you know, we just don't know. I think it's really great, and I think it's uh, wonderful that it's so available, that it's so accessible through your website. Um, to anyone right. who wants to use it, that's that's really a great product. Yeah, that's a and, big goal uh, for us. I did put the link for the um, data um, in the chat window of the WebEx, so in, for the participants on the call, if you want to access that, and also the link to the viewer that Amy was demoing. Um, and hi, Amy. This is Genevieve Johnson. I'm the hi. coordinator of the Desert LTC. Hi. Um, I have a question actually um, at your first slide. You had the goal of improving the land cover map, but mm -hmm. I was wondering if you maybe you could talk a little bit briefly about some of the issues that you had that led to really needing to improve that goal or improve the land cover map to reach that goal. Right. And, you know, I wish I would have been on board at the start of the project. You want me to jump in? Try... Yeah, could you do anything? Um, basically what we were running into is that um, – NLCD was just insufficiently, uh, had insufficient resolution to be able to do interpretation and be, have usability below about the county scale for just general trend. And we wanted something that would better support um, the things TPWD tended to do, which was working on more of a parcel scale. So we knew we had to uh, up our game at least an order of magnitude to do that. 
that's kind of, is that what? Um, yeah. Helps? So yeah. So one of the things that we're trying to do in the desert LTC is, of course, do something similar, um, but bridging the border, which is, of course, another issue. Um, and I think using the rationale that you guys um, use would be really helpful in us getting other partners on board as well. And so that's why I was asking that question. Yeah, I mean, we had a we initially we had quite a bit of resistance everywhere because nobody had ever seen this level of data. You know, everybody would think in LCD. And when I was first presenting these and selling the project, I would uh, basically show when once we got some data in, it became a lot easier to sell the project because I could show here's one of our WMAs at our 1984 map, it's got two types. And here it is well, in, in LCD and it's got three types. And here's ours with 40 types. You know, that actually follow, you know, look, the managers could look at it and the people who are using it could look at it and say, oh, that's our pasture here. This, you know, they could recognize features. And so that was the kind, of, that was what was spurring it. We wanted to be able to do uh, have input on have assist in management at the parcel and and at the individual landowner level, and not just say, you know, there's a lot of uh, juniper or a lot of evergreen shrubland in this county. So, great, thank you. We were getting what we get is we were getting my group was getting a lot of requests to do high resolution mapping for individual areas. So we wanted to take that statewide. And just for um, kind of scale purposes and, and resources, what was the, if you don't mind me asking, I forgot if you mentioned it already, Amy, but what was the final um, kind of ballpark total of investment to create this statewide? We were at about $5 million, I believe. And so you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dwayne, but I thought that was With about. Partner. Um, all partner input, all TPWD input, um, we were somewhere between, we were north of $4 million. Okay, thanks. And Dwayne, you want to, um, thank you for being on the call today. Do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? I'm Dwayne German. I'm the Landscape Ecology Program Leader with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And um, so my, Amy is in our program in a, so, and my program is the one that's responsible for this project. Thanks, Dwayne. Are there more questions from the participants? Uh, this is Ian Scott Fleming from the Climate Science Center at uh, Texas Tech University. Hi, mm -hmm. Ian. Hi. Um, so I'm actually working with some researchers that are trying to identify uh, the Playa Lakes in West Texas. Uh, and I didn't see any uh, quick, uh, it, it, as you ran through your slides, a quick look at the, uh, the areas up in uh, Lubbock and uh, up through the uh, Panhandle. Um, did you have any success in b being able to uh, differentiate the uh, sort of uh, playa lakes and uh, ephemeral wetlands uh, from the uh, surrounding areas in your uh, mapping uh, process? We did. We did those based on soil. So where they're correct in the soil layer, they're going to be correct in our layer. Um, I believe that's how we did that, right, Dwayne? Yeah, we've got a hold of. Um, we've been trying to map playas, and I, had, we had mapped them for a project to do with uh, waterfowl surveys um, in the early part of this, of uh, about 2005 using mm -hmm. soils and uh, multi-date TM imagery to identify all the, as many of the wet areas as we could. And then we went through and um, identified from that which ones, look, which ones we believed were playas, and we used that layer as an input to drive our delineation. It's similar to the methodology so that uh, Playa Lakes Joint Venture has implemented. Mm -hmm. they, they're a little more, they've done it a little, uh, I think they just finished theirs. They were this decade. Uh huh. Okay. Sorry. What what group was that? The Playa Lakes. Playa, Playa Lakes Joint Venture has uh, had the latest stab at doing. Okay. 
uh, playas, and that would be for the whole High Plains region. Since mm -hmm. right, okay. Um, and uh, in your um, classification, do you have a uh, a classification specifically for playa lakes, or we have uh, three we, in the High three, Plains? Yeah. We have three playa types. Right. Uh, basically, a playa lake is open water in a playa. On, on a playa soil or an identified playa area, and then we have a shrub and grassland types also, and a wetland type. Right. So we have four different playa types. Um, we also have um, the what what the in the wetlands that are up in, that are in the alluvial soils identified separately. Uh -huh. If the if the soils were mapped as alluvial soils and, and um, nature serve calls those open depressional open wetlands, yes. and then the and the, the salt lakes are identified also in uh -huh. multiple types: lakes, yeah. right. shrubland, grassland, marsh, and open water. For Great. Well, I'll have I'll have to poke around and see uh, what uh, what your um, your tools. Provide and uh, see what we can make use of. Sure. Great. Good. Appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for your question, Ian. Any more questions? These are wonderful comments and questions. Ian, if you um, you might want to just grab the data. From our website, not you don't necessarily have to go just through the tool, and you can subset right. the data. It's all vector data, so you can separate it by attribute. Okay, great. I I, I will poke around and and uh, see what I can figure out, and uh, I will uh, undoubtedly uh, send you some emails when I get stuck or when I need some help. Sure. <laughs> um, if nobody else is going to ask any more questions, uh, and we still have a little bit of time. Uh, uh, for an entirely different project, um, why did you choose the uh, Google Map um, uh, interface for your uh, online tools, and what other uh, alternatives did you consider? We considered AGO, but we weren't getting the functionality out of that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, which was that? Thought, That's uh, RGIS 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 online. online, right. Oh, okay. um, we just couldn't get like the report or analysis functionality out of that. Um, mm -hmm. When we sat down and started really discussing it, um, we wanted to gear it towards a lot of our landowners, land managers, and mm -hmm. we thought the Google Maps interface was just the most widely used um, and easiest to use. That, and we have a programmer that can do it. So that was another uh -huh. deciding factor, right? So, another um, issue is um, this. Just uh, data download and draw rates on AGO or the ARC <laughs> suite was actually slower. The data is ported to um, SDE Spatial, and it's actually shared in the app, and the queries are, are performed within that platform, not at Esri. Yeah. And it, the, so. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we, we have uh, for our climate stuff, we're looking at uh, building some online tools for uh, both for researchers and casual users, and uh, my actual main reason for sitting in on the webinar was to see what tools you had used and, and, and why. Right. Yeah, I mean, Google Maps is just so user-friendly. That's, that's the big thing, and if you're going for a wide audience, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody's used it. Right, and and your uh, your your programmer was he already familiar with the uh, with programming uh, for Google Maps, or did he just pick that up as uh, the progress as the project progressed? No, uh, she already does. Yeah, she already. She had developed many Maps. of the. Yeah. Her group had developed a lot of techniques and tools within for work within this the uh, Google Map platform. So they've been working had quite of an extensive experience with it. One of the reasons they were selected. Hi, this is Valerie Williams. I'm a wildlife biologist for BLM Taos Field Office. 
Hi, and Molly. Amy, this is amazing. This is great. And I thank you cool. for bringing it to us. I had a cool. question. Um, if there is a, a white paper or anything that uh, could, you know, that's published that we might, you know, other agencies, field offices could use on a smaller scale, not the state of Texas, but say right. uh, a management unit using the methodology and trying to emulate some of this stuff to do that this kind of work in our office. Right. The best place to get the methodology, we did not officially publish it, but it is all in our um, supporting documents. So if you were to go to that link I provided for vector files, um, you should be able to download it all there in our, our methodology pretty well outlined in there. So Okay. Results. Great. Thank you. Sure. And I just put that link in the chat window of WebEx also. One thing is get one of the later versions, Phase 5, 4, 5, or 6, if you're getting the phase documents, which have quite a bit of detail, because the uh, methodology evolved over uh, time. And uh, the later versions are the more mature methodology. So that's Phase 4, 5, or 6? Yeah. Okay. One of the keys to it is we were using... Um, was it uh, e-cognition to develop, uh, to do segmentation analysis, to develop uh, objects? The objects, and then, yeah. And then populating the, the objects with all of the modeling variables and then modeling the, and within those objects. If you look at the data, you can see many of the, we left uh, the downloadable data, the objects have quite a bit of the, uh, uh, underlying modeling information of, still in there as attributes. Hi, Dwayne and uh, Amy. This is Daniel Pearson here at USGS. I, I'd like a, I, I have a little bit of understanding about this uh, effort, but maybe you could, if you haven't spoken to already, how long it took and uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, what the time frame of the data set, if I remember correctly, it was done in phases. So when did it begin right. and when did you kind of wrap up production of the work? It started the first, in 2007, didn't we? 2007, 2008, using data from right. 2006 Six. to 2007. Um, and we that was phase one and phase six wrapped up last year, fourteen. So seven years, uh, really almost eight from project initiation to completion. Um, and well, we it, I, I would say this: it, it is a phenomenal effort and a phenomenal data set. And I know, um, uh, I know that there was uh, obviously I saw the stuff about the quality assurance, the, the accuracy assessment, was that done in-house or was that done third party? How was that handled? The, Amy collected all of the field verification data and the analysis was conducted by the contractor as part of the right. reporting requirements. So okay. half of those 14,000 field data points was used to do APC the model. One of the things we did, we made a conscious decision that <coughs> we were when we were collecting field data was to collect it in um, the natural systems as much as possible. So we have limited amount of data in croplands and open water and a lot of the urban. urban, a lot of the things people use for that increase the overall accuracy. So there is some of, of, of these kind of efforts. So we did skew it actually against accuracy <laughs> or against the you know we we collected data within the areas we knew we would have we wanted to know we how good we were doing in as parks and wildlife both for driving the modeling and mapping and driving the and doing air checks is the ground truth data available as part of the data sets online all data collected within public land. land areas or areas where we have specific written permission for sharing that data are are available on request. Okay, thank you. And it includes, that's what, about 12,000 points, Amy? 
11 to 12, yeah. And we have reference photos for all 11,000 plus points. Well, all 14,000, but. Well, what a great um, data set. Thank you for that. Sure, and for anyone, if you can still see my screen, needing methods and sort of summary and how it works, this would be the document, the Ecological Mapping System Summary Report, would be a good place to start. So, um, on our supporting documents page. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Dwayne, for mm -hmm. addressing those questions. And I thank you, Daniel and Valerie, for your comments and questions. And I had uh, one as the GIS coordinator for the Desert LCC, and um, I know that there's a couple of other at least Blair Chirpak from my neighboring LCC that covers a lot of Texas and is on the call too. We use something called a conservation planning atlas. It, it was it looks kind of like ArcGIS online, but my thought is I'm just asking myself how can I link to a web service or link to the data on our conservation planning atlases that a lot of um, LCCs are kind of signing on to to do some data analysis and be aware that this data set exists for them to use. So that's we uh, have published the data as a uh -huh. map service. Okay, great. So there's a um email me and I'll get you the uh link to that. Great. Thank you so much. Because that's how Blair's uh serving Thank it in their database. So Blair already added it to database in? Yes, yeah. he's, he's got it in hers. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah sorry, if she's that, added it already, the then. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I can send you the link to it on database. And sorry about the echo. Good to know. Thanks, Blair. Oh, thanks for adding it. No problem. <laughs> You're on top of that. <laughs> Are there any other comments or questions from the callers? Well, I just want to, uh, again, thank you, Amy, um, and also Dwayne for joining us today and presenting your outstanding work. It's a model for all other <laughs> states and um, especially LCCs as they try to develop this kind of data to this level of accuracy, and you really blazed the trail for the rest of us, so thank you, literally. <laughs> and well, I think Amy drove over 25,000 miles or something to collect all these uh, ground truth points. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and I'll make the slides available to you. This will be recorded, or it has been recorded, to so see so you're aware, and it will be, um, upon review of by Amy and Dwayne, it'll be posted to our YouTube channel, Desert LCC YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to that to be notified as to when it's posted to forward to your colleagues who are unable to attend today. So thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, thanks for thank having you, us, Sally. Uh, Sally. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.